often forget that there's another side of life which is not based on simply solving the economic problems. Now economic problems are definitely there and we do have to think about them, we do have to take care of them. But there's another aspect to life also besides the economic problems and that is to think about our spiritual nature, spirituality. The spirituality, people have some funny conceptions about what spirituality actually means. You know, some people think spirituality is to have experience with drugs. Some other people think spirituality, oh, one man said to, one young man said to me, he said, well, I had a very spiritual evening the other night with my girlfriend. And I said, well, Prabhu, you know, that's not exactly the real nature of spirituality. It's nice you have a girlfriend, but you have to understand what spirituality is all about. And spirituality is something which goes beyond the body and beyond the mind and it's actually meant to bring us to the level of the soul. And speaking about soul, we have to understand the nature of the soul, which is quite different from the body. We live in the body, we have to take care of the body, but at the same time there's something else besides the body and that is the soul. And we like to awaken our spiritual nature. We, in, in, the, in this Bhakti Yoga tradition, we awaken our spiritual consciousness through mantra, by sound, sound vibration. There's a lot of sound everywhere. Singapore is a noisy place. A lot of traffic. If you live next to a highway or something, you know, you, you're aware of the noise which is there. And the constant flow of vehicles. Endlessly here in a city like Singapore. Uh, a lot of noise. That noise is not transcendental. But there, there is transcendental sound, transcendental sound vibrations. And that is what mantra meditation is all about. Awakening the spiritual nature comes by the sound vibration of the mantra. Mantra. That's, that's a common word today. We hear it a lot. It's in the English dictionary now. Chinese say mantolo, right? They have mantolo. They have many mantras in Buddhism also, different traditions. They have mantras. So we, have, we also have a mantra in bhakti yoga. There are many mantras, but there's one particular mantra which is called Maha Mantra. Maha meaning great. So this mantra is very simple and it's based utilizing just three words. Three words, Hare, Krishna and Rama. These are sans Sanskrit words. Now Sanskrit is the mother language of most, most of the European languages, they come from Sanskrit. If you study even Thai, if you look at Thai, there's a lot of Sanskrit there in the Thai language. And in uh, R Russian, they have some links. English, we, we say, well, English comes from Latin. But where does Latin come from? Latin and Greek, they also have the roots with the Sanskrit language. So Sanskrit language is an ancient, very ancient language. And it's a language which 
you, which the scriptures, the ancient scriptures of yoga and meditation, they're all written in Sanskrit. So this mantra, 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 man means a mind and tra means to free or to deliver the mind to take our mind away, to release the mind from the material nature, from the material energy which constantly bombards us. The material energy can bring a lot of anxiety. It can be the cause of a lot of tension and stress. Living in the big city, materialistic environment, naturally there's going to be these things, particularly stress. But by taking advantage of mantra meditation, we can release the mind from that influence. So we have this Maha Mantra, three words, Hare, Krishna and Rama. Hare meaning energy, and Krishna meaning all attractive, Rama meaning all pleasure. So these three words are put together in the form of a mant mantra. They're put together in a combination which will bring the transcendental sound vibration, which will release the mind from the material energy. It acts just like the vaccine. You know, they have the vaccine. Everybody in Singapore is vaccinated. You have the vaccine. vaccine supposed to protect you and so mantra is like that it's like a vaccine it protects us from the material energy so the mantra I'll just tell you the mantra and Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare this is the Maha Mantra and in this combination, by putting the words together in this manner, it's put together in such a way that it can be utilized to produce transcendental sound vibration. And we perform the meditation. You can do it either by chanting to yourself or by chanting together. When we chant together, it's called kirtan. When we chant individually, that's more our own personal meditation. But when we come together and chant, that is called kirtan. And this kind of meditation has become popular, particularly not, although it originates from India, it's become very popular in the USA. In, up in New York State, they have a region there called kirtan, the Kirtan Belt where there's many different centers where people are all engaging in kirtan and this chanting of the mantra, doing this mantra meditation. And like I say, there are other mantras, many mantras, but this is called Maha Mantra. From this one mantra, then you can get everything. If you feel you want to explore with other mantras, they're there, but this is the most common, the most effective one, which is recommended for everyone. So I will say it, I, I will say it again, you can just say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Yeah, you have it on the screen, right? So it's very, usually what we do uh, when we have kirtan, we have instruments like Mataji, you're going to play the harmonium for us and lead a little kirtan? Yeah, you want to do it now? Just for five minutes? Mira is my friend from Hong Kong. She have, she's been a devotee her whole life, you see. She was born in a devotee family, so she's brought up as a child in consciousness of this meditation. She's very familiar with it.
So we often entertain ourselves. We have other instruments like we play a drum and we have also finger cymbals and the harmonium also adds to the, the tune.
one we can. So, how did you feel? Did you enter into the sound vibration of your consciousness? I hope so. We do recommend you that when, she, when somebody sings, it's nice to also chant along, you know, respond, we respond. In the beginning, of course, you want to hear, but once you get familiar with the mantra, if you can also join in and say the mantra, it, it's very effective, very powerful. The effect is it awakens the soul awakens our spirituality. We do have a spiritual nature, but because of our contact, because of our long time in this material world, in contact with the material energy, our spiritual nature has been covered. Just like in the winter time, of course here in Singapore it's not very cold, but some parts of the world it's very cold. You want to cover yourself with blankets. <laughs> you put more blankets to cover yourself to protect from the cold. So, our soul is covered. Our spiritual nature is covered by this material energy. And we do need to remove that covering. And the process to remove it is simply hearing and chanting this spiritual sound vibration in the form of the 16 words of the Maha Mantra. It's an awakening for ourselves to understand more about who am I? Do you ever ask yourself that question? Do you ever wonder, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? These are basic questions, these are inquiries which I often used to ask and I could never get the answer until I met people who were practicing bhakti yoga. But it was in my search for understanding more about life that I got the answers, I got the inspiration from the people who practice bhakti yoga by hearing from them and by reading books like uh, Bhagavad Gita and other ancient books of knowledge, I was able to appreciate more the nature of life and to understand more about who I am, my identity. Of course, sometimes we think like, th there's a famous book, Alice in Wonderland. Did you ever read it? You know that book, Alice in Wonderland? Do you know Alice, she goes into the Wonderland and she gets into the Wonderland and then she says, where do I go from here? So they asked her, well, where do you want to go? And she said, well, I don't really know. So they said, then it doesn't matter which way you go. <laughs> right? So we have to think, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? Have you got visions? You know, not just, I'm not just talking about this life, but after this life, even beyond this life. We have to understand our spirituality. By nature, we are all spiritual beings. And we understand that we've existed in the past, just as we are existing now, and we will exist in the future. We will exist not in terms of the physical body, but in terms of the spiritual soul. The spiritual soul is eternal. You and I are all eternal living beings. We have this body, but this body is not eternal. This body is just a vehicle. It's a vehicle for ourselves. One person I knew, uh, he, he's a, he was a very advanced uh, yogi, spiritual personality. So he had some health issues, he was old, and he had to go to hospital a little while. And so when he came out of hospital, those people who were his students, they were very concerned about him. 
But he said to them, he said, why are you worried? He said, why are you worried about me? He said, if I get a new car, I'm not going to worry about the old car, right? You get a new car, you won't worry about the old car. So the same way, we get a new body, you give up the old body. You don't worry about the old body when you get the new body. Of course, you have to think, what kind of body are you going to get? We have to understand the nature of life. That there is life in all different living entities. The trees also have life. The plants also have, they have life. The, uh, there was a famous Christian saint, Saint Francis of Assisi. So he used to address the flowers, uh, my dear sister flower, and my dear brother tree. And he, he saw the different plants and trees, he saw them also like his brothers and sisters. So one of the things which we do try to practice in bhakti yoga and which does have some effect on the meditation, we try to practice, we're a little careful about what we eat. That we, we try to go for the vegetarian food rather than other forms of life, the vegetables. Well, people may say, well, that's also killing. Is there any difference between eating meat and eating vegetables? Well, there is a difference. There's a difference. Just like there's a difference between people and animals, right? Do you eat people? Would you ever eat people? Could you imagine would, if they were serving human flesh? Would you want to go and have a meal? Some human flesh? <laughs> No, it's not very attractive, is it? So in the same way, as we say humans are different from animals, animals are also different from plants. So in order to awake, to help to awaken our spirituality, there is some benefit to be a vegetarian, to avoid the meat dishes because that involves greater violence. You could say, well, there's violence there. You pick the plants out of the ground. You cut the, the, you cut the crops. But it's nothing like the violence which is experienced in killing animals. And if you have to go to the slaughterhouse, then it, it's very brutal. So we do want to think about these kind of things, we want to awaken consciousness, awake uh, an awareness about life, and principally we want to become aware about our own self, that this life is a journey, and just now this, our human body is only one part of the journey. We're on, all on a journey. We're traveling, and we have been traveling for a long time. Just like you say, no, I don't travel. I just stay in Singapore. I don't travel much, never go anywhere. But where were you before you took birth? Where were you before you were born in Singapore? Do you remember your previous life? We don't remember. But certainly there was a previous life. And just as there was a previous life, the future, there will also be another life. Because the soul is eternal. The soul never dies. The body is just, it compared, in the books of yoga, the body is compared to a dress. Just like I'm wearing this dress. You know, I could wear another dress, I could put on some, you know, corporate clothes and collar, white shirt and tie, you know, I could be a different, would I be a different person? The dress would be different, but it's still the same person. 
And similarly, all of you, you can also, you have different dresses, different costumes which you wear, but you are the same, although you may change the dress. Maybe you work in a hospital, maybe you're a nurse, you wear the nurse's uniform, maybe you're, you're, maybe you're in the police force, you know, you have the police uniform. So similarly, you know, I'm wearing this dress, this is the dress of our yoga institution, the, the, the dress which is worn by the, the formal monks, those who practice the uh, tradition in a full-time manner. So I want to identify myself in that way. I want people should know what I do, what is my profession. So from the dress they can understand. So the, but the dress is not the person. We change the dress. And the same way we change the body. And in this life, in one life, the body changes. You had a baby's body, then you had a little child's body, now you have the adult's body. The body is changing. It goes through changes constantly. The cells in the body are changing constantly. Every cell in the body changes over a period of several years. But we are still the same. We don't feel any change, but the body has changed. So the body is like the vehicle for the soul. Just as the clothes wear out, the body also wears out. It breaks down. You get disease, you get old, and one day you die. Everyone's going to die. We say death is certain. And similarly also, birth again is also certain. The death is just simply the change of the body. So that is the nature of material, the material world. We take birth and we die. But we're the same. We're just simply the soul on a journey. And where are you traveling to? Where are you going to go? it will be determined by the things we do, the actions which we do. Hmm. In every country in the world, they have the same understanding, the basic culture is there. And in Christianity, they say, as you sow, so shall you reap. In China, they say, zhong do de do, zhong gua de gua. Shan yo shan bao, e yo e bao. In Hindi, in India, they will say, Jaisa karega, aisa baraga. Right? <laughs> they laugh, they can. Un so it's the same thing, the same principle that as you sow, so shall you reap. You get the results of the work. The activities, the way we live, the lifestyle which we have will influence the future. Just as the body which we have today is the result of our past. We have received this body because of different things which we have done. Somebody is born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Very wealthy, very good looking, very intelligent and so on. Why? It's the result from the past. They did some good in the past, and they're put into that situation. And someone else is put into a more difficult situation, more problematic, a lot of troubles. It's not by chance, but it's the result of the past. So yoga is to help us to get free from all that, to change all of that, to get away from the, what we call karma. Karma means the, the stockpile of our activities. We have some good karma and we have some bad karma. Just like if you study astrology, if you, if you look at your astrological chart 
and the, the astrologer will see the positions of the different stars and they will say, oh, oh, you have some, you have some doshas here. You have some dosha. Dosha means faults. You know, you have some faults, you know. Do you have any faults? Faults means like, you know, bad habits. You know, maybe, maybe you get angry very easy or maybe you're very lazy or something, you know, things like this. These are, these are typical doshas, you know. You know, I have a lot of doshas on my chart, you know. <laughs> but I'm just saying maybe also you have some also on yours, you know. We all have some good and some bad. We, it may, we may enjoy the good and we suffer the bad. But we should understand these things are not eternal. They're temporary. And they're the results. They're coming. We have, we're in that situation due to the past. But we can change. We can change everything simply by mantra meditation. That is the part of the mantra. That it can destroy all of the past activity so that we can have a clean sheet and we can awaken our pure spiritual nature. You may question, well, what's the value of the spiritual nature? Spiritual nature means eternality, knowledge, and bliss, real happiness. We are not fully aware of what is real happiness. Our happiness is often very flickering, and temporary. It is, that is not spiritual happiness. That is material happiness. One day if something happens and you're very happy by it, the next day you're very angry by it. You don't like it at all. That is the nature of material happiness. It's very temporary, very flickery. But you want real happiness? Well, I do. I don't know about you. You may not want real happiness or eternal happiness, but you can have it if you want it. It's there. It's the nature of the soul. And the soul is the real self. Our real self is spiritual. And we are all meant to be happy. We are meant to be joyful. We have to come out of that materialistic consciousness. We call that materialistic consciousness conditioning, conditioning. We become conditioned, just like you know, in Singapore you drive on, what is it, left, left side of the road? Yeah, you drive on the left side. I'm not a driver, I don't know, but okay, you drive on the left side of the road and uh, from the British and drive on the left side. We're conditioned to drive on, and you go to America, you think, Oh, hey, they're driving on the wrong side of the road here, you know. But in America, everyone drives on the other side of the road. They're conditioned in that way. In the same way, we are conditioned in this world. We are conditioned to think of ourselves as a material body. And we think we take birth and we die. That is the illusion. That is the great mistake. We have to understand what is the reality. The, re the truth of the matter is, we're not bodies. We're not taking birth and dying. We're all eternal spiritual beings. And if we properly understand our spiritual nature, we can come to that consciousness of being very joyful and being very happy. It comes about very easily, simply by singing. Wherever you go, in any situation, any time of the day and night, in any place, you can sing this song. You can sing this mantra to yourself. This is how I began my spiritual journey. I heard the recording on the radio waves or somewhere, yeah, it must have been radio waves. Uh, I heard the chanting and I began to chant. I used to chant myself. 
walking around, going here and there, I would regularly sing the Maha Mantra. I enjoyed to chant this mantra. It brought me relief from all the anxiety of the world, the stress, the problems which we all face in daily life. We can overcome them all simply by this mantra. Hearing this mantra or chanting this mantra even more effective. And you can see it's very easy. It's not a difficult mantra. I think in two minutes you've all memorized it and you can remember it. Now you just have to apply it. It's like we say, you know, you may make a cake and you want to know, well, how's the cake? Is it good? You have to eat it. When you eat it, then you know how good the cake, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And similarly with the chanting, you want to know how powerful this chanting is? You have to chant. You know for yourself, you see for yourself how it works, how it brings about an awakening of the self to understand our spiritual nature. It's not a big change in life, but it's a very vital change. It's essential for our well-being. We want to get free of the difficulties of the material world. We can do it very easily, just simply by taking shelter of this mantra. We want to, uh, we have to understand the power of this mantra, that this sound vibration is not material, it's a transcendental vibration. Someone may say, this is brainwashing. We say, yes, your brain is very dirty. It needs to be washed. And this is how to wash it, with this spiritual sound vibration. And just like bathing, we have to bathe regularly. You know, Singapore here is very humid. You know, you want to take, we like to bathe more, take advantage, to bathe more to keep ourselves refreshed. So similarly, the more you chant, the more you bathe your mind in this mantra, the more you'll feel refreshed and you'll, you'll feel the, the comfort and the shelter of this sound vibration. So this is uh, something which we do together. When we come together, you know, somebody singing, chanting, and also we do on our own. Just like, you know, you can see I have this bag here. So in this bag I have some beads and I hold the beads and chant on the beads. You don't need beads, you can chant without beads, you can chant. You, but some, we like to count, so the beads are good for counting on. And you can have, you, you can chant on your fingers, count on your fingers if you like. Or you can just sing. In the beginning, maybe you don't worry about how much you chant. You can just sing as much as you can. And the more you associate with this mantra, the more you'll feel the benefit, the more you'll feel the awakening of the self, the spirituality, our spiritual nature. And that spiritual nature is understood by freedom from anxiety, relief from all distress. And it will go on, it will fructify as you go on chanting, there'll be an, an awakening of knowledge understanding more that I'm not the body, I'm a soul, I'm transcendental to this body. That is knowledge, and that knowledge brings also joy, the greatest pleasure, the greatest relief from all the stress of the material world. So this opportunity is being given to us it's certainly an advantage, it, it's in your own interest to take advantage. You try to do this chanting. So, are there any questions?
I just I think that I think that to recommend this chanting to all of you is the, the greatest gift I could give you here this evening in the short time which we have. But it's also nice if you have the opportunity, if you can get a Bhagavad Gita, you can also read sometimes. It's a it's quite a big book. You know, it's uh, 700 verses, 18 chapters. But you don't have to read it all at one time. You read a little bit here, a little bit there. You can open the book anywhere. And wherever you open it, you do get a treasure of knowledge, an awakening of more truth about the nature of the world and about our own self. All right, any question from anyone? Anyone? Yes, Prabhu? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, what is the essence of the Bhagavad Gita? The essence of the Bhagavad Gita, yes. The essence of the Bhagavad Gita. See, Bhagavad Gita is teaching, it's, it means the song of Bhagavan. Bhagavan. Bhagavan means, it, it's actually it's like a Sanskrit term for God, you could say. It's a, or the song of God or... Bhagav the song of Bhagavan. So it's a converse, the, the dialogue, two people, Krishna and Arjuna. Krishna is speaking, he, Krishna is a teacher, Arjuna is a student. So Arjuna, has, he's confused. He has some doshas. I was telling you about doshas, you know, Arjuna said, he said, because, he said, I have some, my, because of my miserly weakness, Arjuna was, uh, he said, I, I'm, I'm, I have this weakness, I'm miserly. Miserly in the sense that I don't want to use my human life for its real purpose. I want to deny the real purpose of my life. But he turned to Krishna and he asked Krishna to teach him. So Krishna explained yoga. And he explained the connection, the yoga ladder, karma yoga, which is yoga of action. Sometimes people think yoga is just sit and do nothing, but yoga is more action. And then it's yoga of knowledge, that we should know also what we're doing, why we're doing it. And then the bhakti yoga, yoga of love and devotion and surrender. So you could say the essence of Bhagavad Gita is to understand, first of all, who, the nature of our own self, that's the beginning, the, of the Bhagavad Gita, to understand myself as a soul, and then to go on understand more about the nature of the soul, and how to properly engage the soul, so that we can develop further our spiritual nature. So Krishna explains this. He explains many different paths. There are different paths which he, he will explain, just like Astanga Yoga. We're hearing tonight about Astanga Yoga. So that's explained in one section. And Arjuna heard about the Astanga Yoga, and he said, oh my goodness, he said, I can't do that. He said, <laughs> he said, my mind, he said, my mind is more difficult to control than the wind. You know, to ask somebody to sit, because this, you're required to sit and meditate. Any Astanga Yogis here? You doing Astanga Yoga? No? 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 Anyway, if you do Astanga Yoga, you know, there are steps, you see. And so you start with Yam and Niyam, rules and regulations, and then Asana, different postures, and then Pranayama, nose, the nose pressing yoga, controlling the breathing, and then you go on to meditation. So you have to do the preliminary step before you can do the meditation. You have to learn to make your body flexible because then you have to sit, and you're going to sit for a long time. And people did the Sastanga Yoga for a very long time. In our present day, our present environment, it's not possible really to do Astanga Yoga. We don't have the duration of life. In other ages, people live much longer. They could do that kind of thing. But we have a short life. So we have to have a process which is quickly effective. 
takes place and the effect is rapid and you feel the progress very quickly. You do a stanga yoga and <laughs> you know <laughs> you can really labor. It's very tiring and it can be quite aching and painful and very difficult for a lot of people also just to get people, you know, to sit still and to you know, not very few people can do that. So there has to be a yoga which is much more effective and more rapid and that is explained to be the bhakti yoga and it, through the Bhagavad Gita you see the different yoga processes while they're introduced, their limitations are brought out and it's encouraged that you should take to this path of bhakti, it's a bhakti yoga which is at the top, which is the best and most effective one and the, the essence of bhakti yoga is surrender. <laughs> Surrender. Surrender means ta taking shelter of this Maha Mantra, particularly chanting the holy name. So the essence of Bhagavad Gita, one word, surrender. Surrender our soul. <laughs> surrender our mind. The mind is a real problem. Come fighting with the mind. The mind, what doesn't, the mind always resists. The mind said, no, I don't want to surrender. The mind said, no, I don't want to do this. The mind is always opposing us. The things which we should be doing, the mind will stop us. We have to learn to control the mind, to conquer the mind. Do you know how to conquer the mind? It's, it's compared to controlling a wild animal. You know, I, I was just in Dubai and they were telling me how the, the sheikh in the, in the Middle East there, um, he, has, he keeps some wild animals in his palace and he has a gorilla there and sometimes even they have a tiger also there in their home, <laughs> you know. So how do you deal with these animals, you know, if you want to train them? How, so our mind is a bit like the wild animal. Do you know, if, if you ever capture a, a tiger or something and maybe you want to make it your pet, you want to keep it at home, how to train it? So there is a system. They put it in the cage and then you don't feed it. You starve it. Let it get really hungry. And then what they do, then they will beat it. You say, oh, that's very cruel. But no, there's a reason behind it, that they will give, they will beat it, not beat it to death, but just beat it so that it's really, you know, pain, it knows you're the master, you beat it, you know, and then you feed it. So in this way the animal comes to know, this man is very powerful. He put me in the cage, he beat me, now he's feeding me, I better do what he said. So dealing with our mind is like that. You have to beat the mind. You have to starve the mind. And then you feed the mind. And in this way our mind can become a friend. But the uncontrolled mind, if the mind dominates us and tells us what to do, that mind can be the enemy. And the greatest enemy. So you have to understand when is your mind a friend and when is it your enemy? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We'll stop here today. Yes? Yes, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> Hare Krishna. Niman Dosha Jungarat. Singapore then? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> So Chintin Woman Jang Dao, Yuja the Hao Chu. Yuja the Hao Chu. Kay Bang Chu Woman, Bin Chang Ping Ha, Kung Chu Woman, the Sing Yi. Liao Jia, Wash She. Woman, your Renly de Shinti, Renly de Shinti, Kay, Yingai, 
问：“我是谁？我从哪里来的？为什么有痛苦？为什么他有快乐，我没有他的快乐？”我们都不一样，每个人有自己的业报。业报 ，can understand you？ 嗯。说前世，有的人做得好，有的人做得不好。那现在我们有别的身体，我们可以享受我们的情况。以前做得不好，说现在我们有痛苦，有经济的问题，有困难。我没有好的妻子，我的妻子都跟跟我吵架，我家庭不平和，我们也没有孩子，我、哦、很辛苦，很辛苦。所以，这个是不好的业报。有好的业报，我有钱，我有好的妻子，有好的工作，生活很舒服，没问题。为什么都这样？就每个人都自己的业报。我们可以把我们的业报都消除了。通过瑜伽，通过父爱瑜伽，我们可以把我们的业报改变，变好，变平和。因为灵灵魂的本性是永恒的快乐，可是我们没有这个觉悟，我们还是认为我是这个身体，所以我们是无条件选择的灵魂，我我们认为我是这个身体，所以通过念曼陀罗，你可以变灵性的，可以提高你的。直觉，了解你是灵魂，明白吗？你们也念哈利克什吗？你念过？没有。我们也推荐你们，应该也多吃素，少吃肉，多吃素，最好不吃肉。<笑>有的人认为我吃素没有没有好吃的东西，就吃一些绿叶菜，有饭没有好吃的。你不知道做饭，你需要学习做饭。如果你不会做饭，肯定吃素很辛苦。所以你一定要学好，做好素食。成为一个素食主义者，最重要，你一定要会做饭。<笑>吃外边的东西，没有自己做的饭好。你会做饭吗？会啊，很好。Yes. Yes, yes. You need to know. You need to know if your soul is awakened. How do you know if your soul is awakened? If your soul is awake, if the soul is awakened, then we'll act as a soul. We won't act as a body. How does a soul act? We'll act in the consciousness that I am a soul. I'm not the body. In other words, we'll control the senses. The body means the senses, and the most active of the senses is the tongue. The tongue is very active in eating and in talking, and so we will control the tongue. Not that we will、uh, give up eating or talking, but rather we will be careful what we talk and what we eat. We will be discriminating over what is our proper food and what is our proper speech. We should speak words which are truthful and pleasing. We don't want to just agitate others and, you know, create arguments and bad feelings between people. We want to speak words which are which are truthful and pleasing.、And、so this is control of the tongue, control controlling the senses. 
and the tongue is the most difficult to control. So if you can control the tongue, then you you pretty much got it made. And so, if, but to control the tongue, you have to understand that you are a soul. You're not the body. If we think in terms of the body, then we'll act for the pleasure of the body. The body wants to enjoy the senses. We want to eat, we want to sleep, we want to mate, we want to defend. This is the animal activities. But the soul is meant to help us to appreciate more the, the value of the human life. And having a human life is something different from the animal. So, it's important for us to try to understand the relationship between the mind and the senses and the soul. We give the example uh, just like there's a, a picture which we have. It, it, there's a chariot and there are horses. You ever do any horse riding? You ride a horse? You don't, well, not much chance in Singapore, right? Not much place for horse riding here. Anyway, if you, if you go on a horse, you know, they're pretty powerful creatures, you know. It's really difficult to hold them. You have to really... So the, horse, the horses are powerful. You have horses pulling the chariot, and the horses are controlled by rain. The rain goes through the mouth of the horse, and you pull on the rein of the horse, and that way you can, you know, you can get the horse to go left or right or stop. You know, the, it's all controlled by the reins. So the, 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 the senses are like the horses. Senses are very strong and powerful. And they have to be controlled by the reins. The, rain, the, mind, is, the mind is like the sixth sense. Generally, we have five senses, but the mind is like the sixth sense. It's the king of the senses. But higher than the mind is intelligence. Intelligence is the to understand what we should do, what we shouldn't do. What is right, what is wrong. You know, oh, I need some money, I'll just rob the bank. <laughs> but is that intelligent? It's not very intelligent, no. You don't go and rob the bank, you know. So intelligence guides us what is proper to do and what we shouldn't do. And that intelligence, that is seated next to the soul. So above even the intelligence is the soul. The soul, the, the intelligence is like the driver who's holding the reins, which is the mind, and the senses are the horse. And then the passenger on the chariot, that is the soul. And the chariot, which they're all seated on, that is the body. The body's a vehicle, the chariot, right? So that is a, this way we understand the connection between the driver and the, the reins and the, sen, the horses. So the senses are the horses, the reins is the mind, the driver is the intelligence, and the passenger is the soul. The body is the chariot. So the intelligence you're talking about, is that the zihui in Chinese? Zihui, yeah. Zihui. Then yeah. the yeah. mind would be the... Is it the singing. Ling Huan? Mm -hmm. So we get that intelligence. It, you know, that's why we read the Bhagavad Gita also. It helps to get more intelligence. And by chanting, you chant this mantra also, it awakens that intelligence within us. This knowledge is within us, but it's covered. We have to awaken it. This chanting helps us to bring out, to bring forth this knowledge. Okay? Yes? Niyo Wantima? Niyo Wantima? Niyo Wafani? Niyo Okay. Okay, we have, we have some spiritual food, yoga food, to distribute to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hare, Hare Krishna.